Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presentation, D-Zone Data Pipeline Trends, Simplify Data Architectures with an Open Lake House, brought to you by Dremio. I would like to introduce our presenters for today's webinar. Jeremiah Morrow is responsible for content related to Dremio's technology, cloud, and channel partner ecosystem. He has held sales, content, product, and industry marketing and analyst relations roles for several companies in the technology space, including Vertica, OVH, Software One, and Gartner. John Esposito works as a technical architect, teaches undergrads, whenever they will listen, and moonlights as a research analyst for DZone. When he isn't annoyed at code written by his past self, John hangs out with his wife and his cats, Gilgamesh and Behemoth, who look and act just like their names. And then, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, take it away. Thanks, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Um, I want to start off with, uh, with a quick agenda for the next 45 uh, minutes or so together. Uh, so first, John is going to walk through the methodology and some of the findings uh, from the D-Zone Trends Report on data pipelines. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got here, uh, primarily about the rise of the data lake uh, and the, uh, the complexities and inefficiencies that they've introduced in our data architectures. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about the limitations of modern uh, architectures and how and why this concept of an open lakehouse platform uh, simplifies data architectures and makes working with data uh, very easy. I'll end with a couple of customer stories and three final thoughts, uh, and that'll be it for the formal presentation. Uh, again, we should have plenty of time for Q&A at the end, uh, but as we mentioned, you don't have to wait until the end to submit your questions. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to John Esposito to talk about the D-Zone Trends Report uh, for data pipelines. Thanks, Jeremiah. Um, so uh, just to introduce this series um, and then talk about this specific survey. Um, here at D-Zone, what we do is every month or every two months, um, we run a survey on a fairly large global audience of software professionals, mostly developers, with even within that a little bit of extra emphasis on enterprise developers as our survey population. I'm asking them a combination of like technical and career questions about the sort of work that they do, the kinds of approaches they take at a technical level to solving problems, um, and also a good decent chunk of their kind of like uh, pain points and uh, sources of suffering and their preferences as well. Um, part of the reasoning behind the combination of the sort of more level technical questions, the um, higher level like business and career questions, and the sort of softer subjective response questions is that um, in our experience, the, the way uh, software actually gets built, and also the way the industry trends is somewhat conditioned by the feelings of the people who are building the software. So if something is really unpleasant, even if it's doable, that may drive a whole new like sub-area of um, software development. Um, if something is not doable, of course, a solution will solve that, but even just making things easier is, is a giant driver here. So we're trying to get an early sense of um, of that subjective side as well as the objective problem, technical problem-solving side of software development. Uh, in this particular case, for this particular survey, um, we uh, got 317 uh, total responses. Um, that's after cleaning, uh, like spam responses and that sort of thing. Um, we had a few different uh, sub-targets, but our major groupings of research targets were ETL and ELT techniques, um, the role of data pipelines in the software profession more broadly, and a little bit more low-level data pipeline design. Uh, so we conducted the survey this year in March, April. Um, we published the results on dzone.com or, or some of the results, the public results are available in this um, trend report, which you can download on dzone.com, um, which I believe um, at least some of you already have. Um, and um, I'd like to focus today just on a couple of the points um, out of a, a larger set of points that we already published. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the first is just um, um, how, what different approaches to ETL um, do data extract uh, transform and load do people actually take in practice? Um, and this was inspired partly by our own experience doing um, enterprise consulting, um, often with larger companies. Um, and uh, it turns out, un a little bit unsurprisingly, um, the largest and the most commonly um, ranked response to um, how you approach ETL was by some sort of manual process. Um, now, the reasoning we hypothesized behind this, um, which we have a little bit of reason to think is the case, um, is besides our own like um, ad hoc experience, is that 
Um, in especially uh, complex contexts like enterprise contexts, especially in ill-defined domains, that is to say where the business processes are either um, heterogeneous um, and or tacit and or distributed, uh, which increasingly is how business and um, software systems go these days, um, it's often not worth the trouble to build a completely automated pipeline from scratch using your own custom code um, when a large chunk of the data load is one time or if the transformation is occasional um, or if the transformations require um, a good bit of judgment um, and, and it would take an awful lot of time to make explicit the kind of implicit assumptions that subject matter experts that SMEs have when, uh, when transforming, when massaging data. So um, this ranking in our survey was consistent with our, our own experience um, in enterprise consulting, but is still kind of sad. Um, it's kind of unfortunate because um, obviously in, in principle, one of the things that anything that's based on the lambda calculus or based on any kind of um, notion of a function, which is of course what computing is, um, should be able to handle something like a, a data transformation um, in a not so manual way. Um, if you've had experience, which I'm sure a lot of um, you, uh, our, our attendees here have had, doing this sort of work, doing um, ETL in an enterprise or in a, a distributed context, you probably have often felt that pain and also tried to had to make that judgment call about how much time to spend doing something manually, maybe a few times a year versus how much time to spend building from scratch a kind of automated pipeline. Um, the, the second most common approach that uh, to ETL that we saw, and this was a pretty, um, pretty close second, was ad hoc batch scripts run on a schedule meaning you're going to write some kind of thing. Um, often it's a Unix bash script um, or the Windows equivalent in PowerShell um, or some kind of other scripting language um, that meshes together. Uh, this might be in the middleware. This might be on some endpoints and systems, whatever, that meshes together a few different things in a, a fairly straightforward linear fashion. Um, these are, um, when we call them ad hoc, by that we mean that they're not really part of any systematic approach to uh, data warehousing or data lake design. Um, they're just, we have a bunch of data and it's got to be moved at a certain sequ uh, cadence. And um, we know linearly what those transformations need to be and we can put those into code. Um, that's the second most common. Um, that, again, is not going to be ideal, both because of its ad hoc character and because of its um, uh, linear character, typically. So the takeaway we took from this was that um, uh, it would be really nice if ETL could be a little bit um, less manual and a little bit less, less ad hoc. And that, again, is sort of and focusing on the subjective element, that's kind of subjectively what we care about um, in our experience. Sorry, can you hear me? Yep, can you hear you now? All right, sorry about that. Okay, uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? All right. So um, now, when we now that we developed a sense that the um, uh, the type of approach to ETL is often more manual than you think, um, the results of this next uh, question that we asked should probably not be surprising, um, which is the amount of time spent on ETL is rather shockingly high, um, or shockingly if you're thinking that we live in some sort of like modern perfect age of uh, absolute um, completely unleaky abstractions in data pipelines, and not shocking at all if you've been involved in this kind of work. Uh, for years. So uh, as you can see, there's a really broad distribution of how much time is spent on ETL work um, among the professionals who responded. Um, so we just taking a very crude arithmetic mean, which is not a very good metric, this is why we're showing you the curve, but a very crude arithmetic mean of the results is that almost half of our respondents, um, again, majority of whom were developers, um, more than 70% of whom were developers, spend almost half of their time, spend 44% is the arithmetic mean here of their time working on ETL. Um, that's um, kind of um, disappointing, again, consistent um, with my experience in, in, um, as a technical architect. Um, it often turns out that um, uh, it, when we go back over the, the, you know, the burn downs and look over the timesheets for projects, we often spend a lot more time on this phase on ETL, either up front or on, during the course of the project. Um, than we anticipated. And this doesn't just magically go away um, once a piece of software is built. Um, edge systems are going to start, uh, they're going to change you know, either their data models or they're going to change the, um, the possible cadence of synchronization or um, various things that require you to keep working on, keep rebuilding um, these pipelines. And again, if those are done in great part manually or, or via ad hoc scripting, then um, the problem you're going to run into is that uh, you keep spending time over you know, more and more 
it's not just one and done, even though you felt like it would be. So the takeaway here is that 44%, again, very, very rough arithmetic mean of the time of respondents um, of a predominantly developer audience here, at focus on enterprise developer is spent on ETL. Um, that's not what you as a developer, that's not what I as a developer would like to spend my time on most of the time. Um, it's not um, also probably the best use of the, the cost of a developer hour. And um, I've only worked a little bit with data scientists, but maybe Jeremiah can um, talk a little bit about, I believe you were saying the other day that um, the data scientists that you guys work with also spend an inordinate amount of time just on this stage. So oh, for sure, yeah. Um, we see, and I've seen numbers all over the place, uh, but one prominent, uh, one prominent, he's the father of column store, uh, Michael Stonebreaker, um, mentioned that uh, some of the data scientists he works with uh, spend as much as 90% of their time integrating data sources, um, building ETL pipelines. And, and I'll actually share a customer example from Dremio's world where uh, the data science team was spending a lot of their time building uh, custom dashboards, um, piping data in. And that's a, that's a pretty low level activity for a very high value employee. Uh, if they're spending their time doing that type of integration work. They're not spending time building models and, and doing the things that really get them jazzed up to be there. That's right, and from my experience coming from the like combined, like combined academic industry background, um, typically an expert in something like statistics is not going to be the best software engineer and vice versa. For building these kinds of pipelines, you need to have a little bit of understanding of both. And um, the the scientists will often be like, you're, you're not really understanding how I'm modeling this, and so it's your actual ad hoc scripting is going to be pretty brittle compared to the kind of work I'm going to need to do in the future. And then the software engineer is going to think of the data scientist's code, like um, who taught you to code? What, what do you think it's like 1970 and you're writing APL or something like that? Um, so it's it's sort of a misuse of time. And it also produces an inferior, like more brittle kind of a pipeline yep. in my experience. Um, one other thing to note, um, I don't have a slide on this, but um, uh, a majority of survey respondents also said that 60% um, of survey respondents said that they have learned a new technology of some kind of language library platform in order to implement a data pipeline. Um, and again, whether that's a good thing or not is uh, you know, dependent on the for utility of the technology. But in um, our experience in, again, in enterprise software consulting, um, a lot of the time the technology learned is not one that's generally useful for the rest of your work. Um, so for example, um, if you're a Java developer, um, and you need to learn, uh, let's say, Python as a common kind of uh, data manipulation language for ad hoc scripting. You may not, it may be nice to know Python, it may be fun, um, and it is kind of fun to write Python, but it's not actually going to get you better at your primary um, job as a Java developer. Um, but it may help your career because of this ancillary role in ETL. Again, 60% of our respondents say they've done that. Um, and that has cost as well, of course, learning things that don't have immediate side effects. Uh, all right, so uh, next slide, please. So um, that's focusing in now on the subjective side again. Um, again, this is an audience predominantly of developers um, and architects. Um, mostly, uh, let me see, it was, I think it was 57% have had have five, uh, more than five years, I should say, of experience as software professionals. So this is on the more experienced side. That's sort of the, the mark where sometimes people get called senior engineer or something like that, or senior developer. Um, and the question we were wondering is like, well, given that you're spending a lot of time doing this data pipelining work, do you really want to, or are you kind of doing it because you have to? The, the fact that you learned a new technology to do it suggests maybe you're doing it out of necessity because you didn't know that before for a majority. Um, but as I said, uh, the industry, um, the tools available, um, and the, the time spent and the allocation of resources spent um, building software or building software systems I mean, is, is often also driven by the subjective experience. And so well, the question is, well, given all you're spending 44% of your time and 60% of you are learning a new technology to do ETL work or data pipelining work, um, do you want to be doing that? So we asked a question like, uh, what kind of, like, can you just rank what you would like to do out of all these various kinds of, various aspects of software development? Um, this is a question that we ask in multiple different surveys, um, partly in order to, you know, correlate the results with other questions, like, is it the case that people who prefer to design algorithms performance actually also uh, follow solid arbitrary and design principles or, or do so less because solid is more about maintainability than about performance, that sort of thing. Um, so this ranking is not an unfamiliar one from other surveys either. Um, but here we're focusing on how uh, data extraction, transformation, and loading, whether it's EAT or ELT, is definitely not at the top of the pack. Um, it's right around the, um, the middle of the pack, or it's a little on the lower end. 
Um, and what that means is that our take on this is that because this is not the most preferred subjective aspect of software development, um, it's probably not going to be the thing that people are going to keep their jobs for, are going to um, like uh, try to get a job in this area for or to proceed to the company for. Um, it's going to be something they do because they have to um, for a significant number of respondents. Um, so we would suspect based on this result that, uh, that mature tooling around ETL that doesn't require you to spend all that time um, should arise in response to the subjective needs of software um, professionals. Uh, one more slide. All right, um, one of the other questions we asked then was um, a little bit on the narrow like design side. So um, when you're designing a software pipeline, the data pipeline, of course, um, what you have to do is it's, you're not just like translating one set of columns to another set of columns in a relational database. Um, if you have columnar data and you have relational data and you have time series data and you have um, some sort of like a, uh, I don't know, like simple key value stores. All of these different um, storage models, and the, the worst example I've ever worked with is um, building graph databases, specifically semantic knowledge graph databases, like using RDF into data pipelines, worst meaning the most tricky. Um, the kinds of the transformations you're going to have to do are going to be harder and often less performant and sometimes more brittle, um, depending on the heterogeneity of the storage models. Sometimes you need different storage models because of the nature of the application. Sometimes you don't because you're kind of stuck with um, a storage model that was chosen for some reason extrinsic to your application because some other part of the enterprise um, needs a columnar store because there's a, a requirement that everyone uses RDF to define all semantic resources. Um, and so our, our, our question here, again, is a subjective one. It's, we know that you're gonna have to often model um, data pipelines very heterogeneously across storage models, but is there any desire pressure, any sort of experience pressure to prefer not to do that? And as you can see from these results, um, a, a large majority or a significant majority, I should say, um, do prefer minimized storage models. That is to say that they prefer to have as few as possible of relational graph, semantic graph, um, the columnar and so forth. And you can understand that again, if you're um, designing data pipelines, um, when these transformations have to be done at this very fundamental level, um, you have not just the, the definition of the, the functional transforms um, in sequences to define, but you also have to think about uh, distributed systems problems, you have to think about performance problems, you have to think about um, cap theorem types of problems, um, and that becomes painful, tricky, and often almost inevitably suboptimal, which is not satisfying. Um, so sort of moved down the stack to um, from very high level time spent through a little bit of like feelings pressure to a little bit more on the um, level of at least a high level, but the technical um, pipeline design preferences. Um, I, I think part of the survey's purpose was to understand these needs. Um, and I'm happy to ask, uh, answer more questions about either these uh, data points or anything else um, we uh, did research on. But um, in the of time, I think I'll hand it over to Jeremiah now to talk about um, Dremio's experience and some solutions. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, John. Um, so Dremio sponsored this survey. Uh, we have a very strong interest in ETL pipelines uh, and um, evolving uh, data architectures. Um, and so I want to share a little bit of our perspective on how we got here uh, and what can be done about it. Um, and so I want to start with the growth of, of data lakes. Um, and to get there, I actually want to go way back in time to uh, the Enterprise Data Warehouse, uh, which is what businesses have been using for decades now. Um, the first data warehouses were proprietary appliance-based solutions, and they were really good at what they were initially designed to do. Uh, they could collect and store primarily structured data from business systems housed in a data center. And they could make that data uh, available to data consumers for analysis uh, via a variety of, of BI and visualization tools. Uh, the problems arose, started to arise uh, with the growth in volume, variety, and velocity of data, um, especially data from outside of the data center, um, semi-structured and unstructured data. Um, and the data warehouse struggled to keep pace. So, Businesses turned to the data lake, uh, first with Hadoop, uh, and then with cloud and on-premises object storage. Uh, and data lakes were also very good at what they were originally designed for. Uh, they were fantastic as cheap repositories for large volumes and a variety of data, uh, especially that semi-structured and unstructured data. And they were good for exploratory data science projects by small teams of data scientists. 
Um, but the data uh, lake was never really able to fully replace the data warehouse. Uh, and so what you see in a lot of organizations today is this cooperative architecture with one or multiple data warehouses um, sitting alongside uh, one or more data lakes. Um, and both of those are still generally doing what they were originally designed to do. Uh, if you talk to most companies today, they'll tell you that the data lake is still primarily uh, where data science happens. Uh, and the majority of BI and reporting workloads are still executed in a data warehouse. Um, and then if your business has a really important data source uh, that needs lands in a data lake uh, and is necessary for a specific report, uh, you might do some transformation via ETL uh, or EL with T uh, in order to move that data into the, into the warehouse. Um, the problem then is that the newest and fastest growing sources of customer and operational data over the next several years will be semi-structured and unstructured data. And the first destination for that data will be a cloud data lake. Um, but we still need that data uh, for a growing number of data consumers, uh, business intelligence and reporting. And so data teams will need to continue to build uh, many ad hoc and manual ETL pipelines in order to move that data into proprietary formats and make it usable by the data warehouse. So that creates something like this graphic uh, where we have a tremendous amount of new data landing in the data lake uh, and a growing number of ETL processes that are often manual and ad hoc. Um, as the number of ETL pipelines proliferate, you get this complex web of transformation workloads that becomes very difficult and time consuming for data teams to manage. Um, and in order to satisfy uh, increasingly aggressive SLAs for query performance, um, many data teams find themselves building and managing custom data copies uh, in the form of BI cubes and extracts to get the performance that they need. Um, this architecture creates a few problems. Uh, first, any changes to the data pipeline are manual uh, and require requests to the data team. Um, the second is as you move up the stack to the data consumer, you lose flexibility and data scope um, where modern analytics requirements actually demand more. Uh, and third, data teams find themselves managing this massive backlog of data requests, uh, some of which can take weeks or even months uh, to fulfill. Um, and of course, data copies create consistency issues, uh, additional costs and governance risks um, for, for data teams and, and organizations. Um, John, I think you, when we were talking, you had mentioned that you had uh, a story from your consulting life um, that sort of mirrored this graphic or some of these challenges. Did I get yeah, that right? Actually, yeah, just fairly recently, um, and this is one example, and it's not that unusual to have something like this, as um, Jeremiah was saying. Um, I remember we were building um, basically a transactional system for a client um, for um, providing um, uh, something like um, making claims against damage or improperly manufactured materials. Um, there was a, some fairly complex business logic we had to run through and evidence that had to be provided by, by um, some of the uh, client's customers to make sure that they were making claims that could be validated and that could be investigated. And um, this is essentially a, um, a transactional kind of a process. It's, it's like a, something like an RMA process or related to that. Um, but it turns out, um, in order to facilitate this in the past, um, what our client had been doing was um, their um, sales reps or their customer service reps had been producing ad hoc reports from a BI system. And it turns out that that BI had been doing system had been was the only place where a bunch of the relevant data that the customers actually needed for this effectively transactional RMA process was available. So um, the only solution that was even possible within the time allotted, which was a really awful one, I thought, um, was for us to, for this transactional purpose, start pulling in um, outputs of uh, this BI system and then parsing that and um, meshing that together with actual transactional data, like orders placed and um, and uh, like photographs taken of the damaged materials. And that was both very slow um, because the transformations were non-trivial. Um, also, it was extremely fragile um, because these BI reports were being designed by people who were uh, not interested in uh, this entire process. They were just trying to and we're familiar with the internal use of these BI reports, um, and also meant that um, we had an entirely new system coupled that really didn't need to be if we had a, a better designed pipeline. This we implemented, of course, as a temporary solution, 
Um, and then of course uh, the client was like, well, it's working, so we're done. And now probably floating out there still is this massively suboptimal, overly complex, um, not very well performant, um, like impedance mismatch system um, because we had to unnecessarily jam a system designed for one purpose into a system that was uh, designed for a totally different purpose because that was what was available at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, um, we we see that often uh, these manual and ad hoc processes, and then uh, any changes that need to be made to that system. Um, that's also incredibly manual, and it can take uh, weeks or months uh, to to get the right report. Um, so. Now I want to talk a little bit about the Open Lakehouse uh, platform. Uh, Lakehouse is a term that is um, out uh, in the wild quite a bit these days. Um, and so I want to start with a few definitions. Um, so at its core, the Lakehouse is this concept of combining the flexibility and scalability of the data lake uh, with the data management, data governance, and analytic capabilities of, uh, of the data warehouse. Um, so in Dremio's case, uh, it combines two solutions. Uh, the first is Dremio Sonar. Um, that is a SQL query engine, a query accelerator, and a semantic layer that's based on Apache Aero um, and gives data consumers the ability to perform ad hoc and exploratory analytics directly on data lake storage. Um, so no need for complex ETL pipelines, no need for uh, data copies, uh, in the form of BI cubes and extracts, um, just access the data lake uh, directly for analytics. The second piece, uh, and this is the house part of the of the lake house, is Dremio Arctic, um, which is an intelligent meta store uh, based on Apache Iceberg that automates and optimizes uh, data management and data governance. Um, and makes uh, data as easy to work with as code. Um, we call it a Git-like experience for, uh, for analytics. Um, so this concept of open lake house is built on essentially two core concepts. Uh, the first is SQL. Um, SQL remains the most common data skill in large enterprise organizations. Um, so to the extent that an analytics solution can leverage existing skills, um, it is much easier to implement, much easier to leverage, and it actually broadens access to analytics um, for both technical and non-technical users. Um, the second is this concept of open, um, built on open standards, uh, built on technologies and formats. Um, so to that end, uh, Dremio uh, Sonar is able to query other data repositories. That includes relational and NoSQL databases, uh, as well as other table formats like, uh, like Hive and, uh, and Delta Lake. Um, and then Dremio Arctic is based on Iceberg, um, which is quickly gaining a lot of traction because of its openness and performance at scale. Um, so data teams can use other engines like Spark or Flink uh, if that tool is better suited for a particular analytic uh, workload. Um, those are available for use. Um, open, in my mind, is a critical capability in this space. Uh, we've seen massive shifts in technologies. Um, many organizations right now are in the process of implementing uh, yesterday's analytics tools, even as emerging tools become available. Um, so if you leverage open formats and technologies, your teams will be much quicker to adopt uh, the next wave of innovation. Uh, the Open Lake House has a lot of advantages from our point of view, um, and some of those will come through, uh, I think, in the customer stories coming up. Uh, but here are a couple of notable ones. Uh, the first two are core components of the Open Lake House that I mentioned, but I think they bear repeating. Um, open uh, the ability to leverage best of breed tools, um, implement new technologies very quickly, um, give data teams the power to innovate if they if they want to um, and when they need to. Um, data teams are also able to use other tools around the open lake house for ingestion and presentation, uh, as well as security, cataloging, AI and ML, um, as well as choose their infrastructure. Um, the second one, as I mentioned before, is built for SQL. Um, that, those are the skills that your data teams almost certainly have today within your organization. Um, the third is a unified view of the data. Um, 
with an open lake house, you have the ability to query data across your organization, not just in the data lake, and query that data in place uh, without having to move it. Um, that includes other relational databases, on-premises, object storage, or HDFS. Um, data consumers, business leaders, uh, everyone wants access to all of our data for analytics, and an open lake house uh, enables that. And the fourth is speed. Um, by giving data consumers direct access to the newest and fastest growing sources of customer and operational data, uh, data teams dramatically accelerate time to value for data that resides in a data lake. Um, and then data teams are no longer a, uh, a bottleneck to getting access to data. Um, many of the data management um, and data analytics capabilities are available directly by the, the data um, consumer. So to illustrate a couple of these points, I want to share uh, a couple customer stories with you. Um, the first is a company called AP Antigo. Um, they are a leading digital insurance agency, and they're one of the fastest growing insure tech companies uh, in the world. They offer a full line of property and casualty insurance options uh, for small business customers of tech, payroll, and uh, other affinity, part affinity partners. Um, they have more than 60,000 customers. They're based in Massachusetts. I am not going to say the name of that town uh, because I have mispronounced way too many Massachusetts towns in my life, um, but they are licensed in 50 states. Um, so in their business, they need to uh, very quickly provide clients with the best uh, price and best fit insurance options. Um, with their previous architecture, they couldn't provide a full view of the customer's information to proactively uh, provide recommendations. Um, data was siloed across their organization in various places, uh, such as parquet files and CSV files within their data lake, uh, as well as Salesforce and other business systems. Um, prior to Dremio, AP and Tigo had to write and maintain ETL pipelines to integrate uh, various data sources. Um, at first, they tried Amazon Redshift, uh, but they had a very small team and needed a solution that didn't require a lot of py uh, Python uh, and data pipeline development. Um, loading in everything into Redshift as their data warehouse became uh, much more difficult as their number of data sources grew. Uh, what they really wanted was uh, to build a customer 360 by integrating all of their data sources into a single data lake. They were looking for a performance solution, uh, the ability to build new applications and functionality uh, to explore their data. So they chose Dremio for interactive analytics for a number of different data consumers. Um, business users, analysts, and management teams use Dremio for ad hoc exploration of their data. Uh, their data engineers and analysts use Dremio for development of new applications, including uh, their internal and external insurance platform. Uh, and AP and Tigo customers and partners uh, were able to access Dremio via their platform to manage their accounts and view policy information. Um, so Dremio provides for AP and Tigo a single source of data for all of their users. Um, more than 10,000 small business clients use the uh, customer portal, uh, which is powered by Dremio to service their accounts. Um, their 100 or so sales and service employees use their internal dashboards to access client information uh, with a Dremio-powered ap application. Um, in the past, they weren't able to bring all of the data together to create a single unified view of their customers. Um, today, they're joining multiple data sources with sub-second response time. Uh, it's 12 times faster to onboard new data sources and uh, implement platform features. Um, from a reporting perspective, uh, previously they relied on manual reports that they generated once a month. Um, now they have access to daily automated reports, uh, so decision makers have much more accurate and immediate uh, insights. And from a development standpoint, uh, the platform enables them to uh, very rapidly prototype new data sources and web services. Um, they were building a new customer platform. Um, when they started with Dremio, they projected it might take uh, multiple years to implement, but they were able to launch it in just uh, one month. Um, as a result, now they're looking at new use cases like dynamic workers' compensation uh, calculation um, that leverages payroll information from their database.
The second story is Dative. Uh, they are a large uh, Germany-based software company. Um, they have 8,000 employees uh, and annual revenues of over 1 billion euros. Um, they make software for tax consultants, uh, lawyers, and accounting offices. Um, every month in Germany, just to give you an idea of scale, uh, more than 11 million paychecks are processed uh, with their software. Um, so they launched a project to track usage of their software products to improve software quality. Uh, their goal was to understand what features clients were and weren't using, um, examine performance, and identify issues with the product. Um, this was important data for a wide range of data consumers within the organization, but uh, especially product managers and developers. Um, as time went on, they saw a massive growth of telemetry data from their products, um, 10 times uh, growth or 300 million records per day was coming into their organization. Um, at the same time, they also saw a massive increase in demand, uh, four times more uh, data request, access requests from employees across the organization. Uh, their data team was unable to respond to that volume and to the demand, uh, especially for ad hoc reports and interactive or exploratory analytics. Um, data requests uh, for them took as long as two weeks to complete. So they started with uh, the community, community edition of Dremio because it was uh, so simple to try. Um, in minutes, they were able to experiment with Dremio um, and found that they could easily integrate with their on-premises data lake environment. Uh, they were able to enable self-service analytics with uh, Dremio's semantic layer. Uh, so business users could explore data related to uh, their specific products. Um, those business users are able to identify which product features are popular, uh, which should be removed, and uh, which bugs within the software they should prioritize. Uh, they're also leveraging data to understand performance uh, and optimize software for a better user experience. Um, they're also able to give access to more data. Uh, previously, due to uh, performance issues, they were only able to uh, give data consumers access to about 30 days worth of data. Um, and that wasn't sufficient, sufficient for the analysis that they wanted to do. Uh, with Dremio, they're able to query data going back several years. Um, prior to Dremio, uh, the central data team was a bottleneck for data requests. Uh, this is that example I was talking about uh, with ETL work. Uh, so the central data science team was actually the team that was uh, producing standard reports for business units. Um, and when they needed to turn around a custom report, it took them about two weeks to produce. Um, once they moved to Dremio, they were able to, the business users were able to run their own custom queries um, and have a report in one to two days. Uh, the semantic layer also meant that business users didn't even have to write a ton of SQL to work with the data. Um, they're able to work with data in business terms. Um, ultimately, product teams at Dative are no longer making guesses as to how well their software is doing in the field. Uh, they're able to make, uh, they have the data uh, and the insights to make better decisions about their software products. Finally, uh, I want to leave you with a couple of key takeaways, three big things um, that I hope you'll take away from the conversation today. Uh, first, the data lake is going to be the first destination for a growing volume and variety of data. Um, the proprietary data warehouse architecture made a lot of sense decades ago when we were primarily concerned with structured data from business systems uh, housed in a data center. Um, but with this shift to the data lake and the shift in the types of data that we are interested in, we need to rethink our architectures to reflect the changing data landscape. Um, second, uh, the complexities associated with manual ad hoc ETL pipelines and proliferating data copies are limiting the potential of your data teams and the value of your data. Um, simplify your data architectures, give data consumers more self-service data capabilities, and give your data teams the bandwidth and the freedom to innovate with data, uh, which as we see in the survey is what they really want to do anyway. Um, third and finally, open architectures enable you to maintain control over your data. Be flexible and agile as you build uh, dashboards and applications on top of the lake house. Um, choose the best engine for the job and innovate with new technologies and tools. 
We talk to a lot of customers who have massive volumes of data stored in proprietary data warehouses, uh, and the ones who are still on legacy uh, systems know they need to modernize. Uh, but the whole point of proprietary formats is to make that really hard to do. Um, as you're considering the next wave of innovation with data, um, consider what my colleague at my last company often ended her presentations with. Uh, it's an acronym called DeSofu, or do not, uh, don't screw over future you. Um, leverage open formats, technologies, and tools, uh, and future you will thank you. Uh, so that's what I have for you today. Um, thank you for your time and attention. Um, and I think we do have time for a few questions. So I can start. Um, are there any advantages to building software and applications on an open lakehouse platform? Um, I will, I'm, I'm going to start this answer and then John, if you have a perspective, I'd, I'd love to hear. Uh, what you have to say, but I think one of the biggest advantages to, is is the openness. Um, I think developers and um, data teams all want to be able to use the tools that they want to use. Uh, they want to be able to be flexible in the future um, and innovate as new innovations arise. Um, and I think they want to be flexible with the infrastructure, uh, how they get data into the system and how they leverage it. So the openness to me is probably the biggest. Um, and then also just the flexibility of a data lake. Um, store any data in there. Uh, you, can, you can build a central repository for data um, and, uh, and, it's, and it's flexible and scalable. And to that, I would just add sort of the, um, the uh, the developer like satisfaction element, um, which is that um, building a system that um, uh, building an application that actually serves the uh, produces the features desired and serves the business needs required um, is often much more satisfying and therefore more sustainable than um, spending weeks writing one report. Um, uh, people that I know who spend a lot of people I know who spend years doing the latter. Um, end up moving on to different areas of, uh, of, the, of the profession because it can be um, a lot of work for a relatively small benefit. Um, yeah. And then regarding the openness to and the, the consideration of future selves, in addition to the future self that you're considering in this case, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a quote that I actually have on a sticker in front of me, um, which is um, always write code as if the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. <laughs> Um, this is this is a good generally for designing code, but in my experience, the the data pipeline code that I've written, those ad hoc scripts, I'm never really proud of them, um, and so you're also more likely to face um, annoyance in the future or blame in the future from yourself or from someone else for doing yeah. something which was too brittle and which is um, not as flexible as your open lake house. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I definitely want to uh, I I wanted to bring this up earlier when we were looking at what do uh, software engineers, what do data teams want to spend their time on? There is such a battle right now for data talent. Um, and the reality is if you're not going to give your team the work that they want to do, they are going to find something else and relatively quickly. Um, and so to the extent that you can give them projects that they, that they love, uh, I, I think all, all the time about that data uh, in the um, data example. Um, the data science team who should be working on uh, producing models and getting them into production and they're building reports um, and ETL pipelines, uh, they could very easily find uh, another position uh, with another company. Um, that's not the kind of work they want to do. Um, how does this, how does this, I'm assuming Dremio, compare to Denodo or other virtual uh, databases? Um, so to a certain extent, and this gets maybe a little more technical than I'm able to, to get uh, myself. So if this doesn't satisfy you, I will, I will happily get you in touch with our, uh, with our teams. Um, but data virtualization is still the concept of uh, analyzing in place, but creating a, a data copy. Um, with, with Dremio, you're not actually copying the data, you're not moving the data in any way. Um, you're, it's essentially, you're, it's, a, it's a SQL statement. Um, and so that creates uh, a virtual data set, but not a, a data copy. 
um, but still delivers the performance that you're looking for um, and, and is scalable. Um, so that's my short non-technical answer. Uh, if, if, if that doesn't uh, help you, I, I certainly can get you in touch with one of our solution architects who, who, who knows a little better. Um, how does Dremio or does Dremio support multi-cloud and or hybrid deployments? I think I mentioned this before, um, but maybe I didn't. Uh, we are in all clouds. We're on-premises as well. Um, Dremio supports analyzing data in place uh, regardless of where it is stored. Um, and actually, in some cases, uh, we have one use case with a company called NCR. Um, using Dremio actually uh, allowed them to build a semantic layer between their legacy environment and their cloud environment. Um, so that they could, in the process of migrating to the cloud, actually access all of their data for analytics. Um, and that accelerated their cloud journey. That gave their executives the answers that they need or the confidence that they needed uh, to move additional workloads, analytic workloads, to, to the cloud. Um, and finally, uh, do you see good adoption of Dremio among software companies? What's the most prevalent use case? Um, we do, uh, and I think probably the most prevalent use case that I see today is the one that I'm also the most excited about, and that's uh, the dative example of telemetry data uh, from your application. Um, one of the cool things about SaaS is that you're always connected to your customer. Um, you always have a view into their experience, um, and so we're seeing a lot of companies do that. Um, analyze telemetry data to understand, customize, uh, improve the, the customer experience, iterate on it. Um, and that's that's really cool uh, to me, especially in, in a world where uh, customers have more options than ever in terms of the software uh, that they're choosing. And I think there was a question about the survey um, on most of the chat, if I can answer that one real briefly. Sure. Go for it. Uh, the question is, um, uh, given that the use of ETL means um, or implies perhaps that there's a no or weak digital transformation strategy, um, the question is in the survey, did we conduct a digital maturity assessment to gauge where the respondents organizations are in the digital transformation journey? Um, the answer is we didn't explicitly do that. Um, it was not an explicit goal of the research, but we did ask several questions that would help us to build such an assessment. Um, and we didn't publish the results of these because we're still chewing on the results. Um, and if you're interested in Talking about this more, actually, feel free to email me. My um, email address is on the slide. Um, but the, the things that I can think of at the top of my head that might be relevant are, um, we asked about um, the use of explicit and formal modeling of data pipelines. Um, the kind of like hypothesis is that um, if you're um, being more explicit and more formal about the modeling of your data pipelines, you're probably a little bit more mature because you're taking it seriously, even if you're building it manually, or at least modeling it um, explicitly and formally. Um, uh, second relevant question perhaps was, um, it has to do with uh, the, the coupledness of design at the system level. So that specific question was, um, how much do you prefer application code and the data that the application immediately ingests to be isomorphic? This has to do with how you make decisions about where that T part is in ETL and ELT and how deep that goes into the application design. Um, the thought here is that ideally, um, the immediately ingested data would not be tightly coupled to the application code um, structure would not be isomorphic to it, um, but um, in our experience, that often ends up being the case, sometimes for good practical reasons, um, sometimes for um, not great reasons, just legacy code reasons or rapid development reasons. Um, uh, third relevant question would be, um, how dependent are you on, or do you really expect that there will always be a normalized relational database as a system of record? Um, what we find is that um, because people, are, as, as Jeremiah was saying, like people actually really can think clearly in SQL and people with lots of different technical backgrounds can think clearly in SQL. That often translates to our system of records has got to be a relational database in a normalized, maybe third normal form, at least like voice cod kind of relational database. Um, and of course that doesn't actually need to be the case, um, but when the thought of I want to do SQL queries forces the um, the actual DBMS um, selection for a system of record, then to us that's a sign of uh, lower maturity. Um, you can disagree with that. Um, and then um, we also just asked a high level question about um, where are you on your journey towards adopting um, a dedicated ETL solution? Like, do you have one? Are you thinking about one in the next one to three months or three to six months, that sort of thing? So to me, those four questions would be uh, correlates of um, some kind of maturity um, of uh, digital transformation with respect to data pipelining, um, but uh, uh, we didn't explicitly ask that. 
Great, thank you. Uh, it looks like we don't have any more questions, uh, so I will leave you uh, with this. Um, first of all, thank you again for joining. Um, reach out to me if you would like to continue the conversation. I'm available via email uh, and via LinkedIn. Um, if you want to get started with Dremio, uh, it's super easy. Um, like I said, you can be spun up in uh, just a matter of minutes. Go to www.dremio.com forward slash get started. Uh, we have a forever free tier um, available uh, on AWS. Um, all you pay for is Amazon infrastructure, um, but give it a try, uh, connect to your data and, and start exploring. Um, thank you all very much uh, and enjoy the rest of your week. Great. And with that, DZone would like to thank Jeremiah and John for an outstanding presentation. DZone would also like to thank Dremio for providing our audience with a great webinar. Lastly, thank you to everyone who attended today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career.